Okay. Well, it's good to see everyone today. We are here to study through Psalm 111. Chapter 111. Moving right through the Psalms at breakneck speed. Sort of, kind of. Well, maybe not. <laughs> Book of Psalms, chapter 111. Let's begin our time together with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your goodness and mercy toward us. We thank you, Father, for the salvation that you've blessed us with. And we thank you, Father, for the Holy Spirit that guides our steps day by day. And now, Lord, we ask that you would enable us by your Spirit to receive your truth, to understand what it is that we're going to read and consider. And Lord, I pray that uh, all of us gathered here would gain some wisdom and some insight that we can use in our daily walk with you and, and in our, our testimonies to other people. So thank you for that, Father. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, chapter 111. 111. I say this a lot, but it's true every time that I say it. And that is that chapter 111 is a very interesting psalm. <laughs> I think I say that about every chapter. They're all interesting to me. They all have their uh, specific characteristics and themes and things that they point out and, and reasons to make us meditate and, and uh, think about the words that we're reading. Psalm 111 is interesting for these reasons. You'll notice in verse 1 it begins with the word hallelujah. Now, you may be thinking, well, that's not what mine begins with. Well, that phrase there, praise the Lord, is the Hebrew hallelujah, hallelujah, translated in the English, praise the Lord. It is uh, one of three consecutive chapters, if you'll notice. I have to turn a page to look. Maybe you don't. Notice the very opening phrase of chapter 112, praise the Lord. And then notice the opening chapter of, or the opening verse of 113, praise the Lord. So three consecutive psalms start off with hallelujah, praise the Lord. Chapter 111 is an acrostic it shows us an acrostic. If, if I knew how to read Hebrew, I would show it to you, but I don't, so I'm not going to be able to do that. But if you count the number of lines in chapter 111, you'll see that there's 22 lines. And in the Hebrew, each of those lines starts with a letter of the Hebrew alphabet, beginning with Aleph, Aleph and ending with Tav. And so this is a very specific uh, style of writing. And what's interesting about that is that chapter 112 is the same way. In the original Hebrew, it's also an acrostic. It begins with a, a Hebrew letter, and it goes consecutively down through each of those lines uh, with a different Hebrew Letter. Now, one final characteristic of, of this chapter is that it reflects what, what I see as the goodness of God, the goodness of God. In chapter 112 that we're going to look at uh, in a couple of weeks, next week will be our uh, nursing home service at uh, Roselawn. Chapter 112 is the characteristics of a godly man who worships the one true God. So it talks about God's goodness here in chapter 111, but chapter 112 talks about the characteristics of the 
of the man or woman who worships this God that is portrayed in chapter 111. So they're, they're paired together, they're related in, in a number of, of different ways. So with that in mind, let's examine what Psalm 111 has for us to say. Praise the Lord, verse 1. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in the company of the upright and in the assembly. So again, hallelujah. Hebrew for let us praise Yah. Let us praise Yah, as in Yahweh, Jehovah. Let us praise God, or shortened in the English to praise the Lord. Now, the English uh, really does a disservice to this because as I just said in the Hebrew, it's let us praise Yah or praise God. Let us praise God. So in the Hebrew, it's more of an invitation to other people to come join us in praising God. And, that, and we lose that in the translation uh, from Hebrew into the English, verse 1, where it just simply says, praise the Lord. And you'll notice there that Lord is all caps. What does that signify for us? That that is Yahweh, that is Jehovah, that is our covenant God. Lord, all caps, is our covenant God, our Father. Then the psalmist says, I will give thanks to the Lord. Now, the implication is, come join me in worshiping Yahweh, but if you don't, I'm going to anyway. That's, that's the implication. He's giving an invitation to come and join me in this worship, but if you don't, I'm going to do it anyway. And when we're talking about praising God, what are we really talking about, folks? We're talking about giving him honor, right? talking about giving him honor. It isn't, it isn't so much, it, it certainly includes worship, but it isn't just worship. We, we live in a, in a time in our nation's history where worship has become somewhat convoluted in the sense that people think that uh, any time that you listen to music and maybe sing along with the song that that's worship. Well, it may or may not be. It's, it's possible that it could be. It isn't automatically worship because there's a Christian song playing and you're singing with it and you feel some kind of emotion. Now, it, it, again, it, it could be, but doesn't mean it always is. And the point that I'm getting at is this. Here, when we're invited to praise the Lord, it is an act of acknowledging who he is and honoring him for that. Now that certainly is what we're doing in worship, but this is so much more than just worship. This is acknowledging, and you're going to see as we work our way down through this chapter, that acknowledging and honoring God in our lives will be manifested by our behavior. It will be demonstrated whether or not we are honoring God. You may know some people, it's, it's heartbreaking to say this, but you may know some people that they sure know how to worship the Lord on Sunday mornings, but if you see them at other times in their life during the week, not so much, not so much. That's, that's tragic, actually. And so the point is that honoring God, giving him honor, reverencing him, results in obedience 24-7, 365, not just on the Sunday mornings when we're here singing songs and, and so on. So the psalmist says, I'm going to worship him even if you don't. But I'm inviting you to come join me. That's his point. And that's a, that's a very good reminder, I think, for us. As I was thinking about this passage of Scripture, 
Some of you probably think this same way. <laughs> I'm reminded often of old hymns. When I am studying through the scriptures and, and a thought comes to mind and I begin to sing, I begin to sing a chorus from back in the day. That's why one of the things I like about Brian is he has a heart for some of the old, old contemporary Christian music. Back before it was called contemporary, there was no designator or qualifier. It was just Christian music. Back in the day of the Jesus people and some of the old Maranatha songs that came out. And, and, uh, but he also likes the old hymns, and, and I like those too. And when I was thinking about this passage where the psalmist says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. This old hymn came to mind, and I know that you know the words. It's a very simple hymn, and we used to sing it a lot when an invitation would be given. And that old hymn is this, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. The first chorus, I have decided to follow Jesus, and we always sang it three times, right? <laughs> Want me to sing it for you? No, you don't. <laughs> it goes, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. The second chorus is, is what I thought of, but I thought I'd put all three of them in there. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. That's the flavor of verse 1 in Psalm 111. Let us praise the Lord. I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. Even if you don't, though none go with me, still I will follow. And of course the result of that, this, this hymn writer knew what he was writing because after the chorus or after the... Uh, stanza, though none go with me, still I will follow. The last one was the world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me. Following Jesus is going to change your life. Amen? We know that's true. Following Jesus is going to change your life. No turning back. And that's, that's wonderful news. Wonderful news. And when we decide to follow Jesus... When we turn our backs on the world and focus on our cross and following Jesus on whatever path he sets us on, we find out that we're not alone. We find out in a hurry we're not alone. Notice it says in verse 1, the last statement, in the company of the upright and in the assembly. So one of the things that, <clears throat> and I've shared this through my testimony many times, Right after Kathy and I got saved, you know, we were bar flies. And um, so we lost all of our friends. <laughs> it's like overnight. Because if you don't go to the bar and you don't hang out with those people and the activities associated with the bar, then you never see them again. And that's what happened with us. And I remember... It was only a couple of months into our new life in Christ that Kathy and I looked at each other and we thought, what are we going to do with all of our time now? What are we going to do? I mean, we're not going to run the circuit on the weekends anymore, so what are we going to do with ourselves? Well, honey, it didn't take very long for our schedules to get jam-packed, did it? <laughs> I can't tell you how fast the Lord snatched us up and inserted us into the places that he wanted us to be, and, and, and we were off and running. You're not alone. And I know that's an enemy. That's one of the strategies of our enemy. He wants us sometimes to believe that we're alone. We're alone in the battle. There's no one else that's experiencing what we're experiencing. 
There's nobody I can talk to because they just wouldn't understand what I'm going through. You know, that's a lie straight out of the pits of hell. Smells like smoke. Because we are, as the psalmist says, in the company of the upright and in the assembly. No matter how dark the days are, and they are particularly dark right now in my opinion, but no matter how dark the days are, the Lord always keeps a body of believers that has not bowed the knee to Baal. Always. In every day and age, the Lord keeps a remnant. And that's good to be reminded of that, I think, brothers and sisters. Notice, though, he says that I will give thanks to the Lord, so I will honor him. I will honor him with all my heart. With all my heart. What does that mean? Well, that means every point of our essence, everything in our being is encapsulated in that phrase, I will give thanks to the Lord. Jeremiah, note takers, chapter 29, verse 13, says this, The Lord says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. God is not hiding from us, brothers and sisters. He is waiting to be found, to be discovered. He's waiting for us to answer his call on our lives. He is in plain view, calling us into this totally consuming. And I say it that way intentionally because I cannot imagine living a day these days, living a single day, without a knowledge of the Lord. I can't even fathom navigating through this maze, this hazy, smoky maze, smoke and mirrors. Everything is an illusion or a deception today, it seems like. Couldn't even imagine navigating these days without the Father, without the Holy Spirit, without knowledge and assurance of Jesus' love, of his sacrifice. For me, it's totally consuming, zealous, joyful relationship that we have with the Father through Christ. King David described this kind of relationship in an earlier psalm, note taker, Psalm 34. Psalm 34, verses 1 through 3, this is what it says. I will bless the Lord... At all times, his praise shall continually be in my mouth. Do you know what happens if his praise is continually in your mouth? You don't have time for other things to be <laughs> in your mouth. <laughs> the, the backbiting and the gossiping and the slander and the hateful speech and, and all of that. And I know. All of us battle the flesh daily, and it's so hard to resist what the enemy lays out there in front of us because it's so easy to just rip off something about something or against someone, and you feel justified in doing it for just a moment. <laughs> I don't want to see a show of hands, but how many of you have ever said something and within five seconds the Holy Spirit was all over you. I said I didn't want to see a show of hands. <laughs> yeah. yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. That's one of the most wonderful aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit in our lives is that the Holy Spirit guides, directs, warns, <laughs> admonishes, lets us know when, um, yeah, you know, that probably wasn't. It's 
So King David writes, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make its boast in the Lord. <laughs> the humble shall hear it and rejoice. You know, I may have to use that Sunday. <laughs> the humble shall hear it and rejoice. If you're reading ahead, you know we're in Mark 10, uh, 35 through 45, which is the next uh, event. Uh, we're, we're getting awfully close to chapter 11 where we'll start the Passion Week. But that kind of gives it away. The humble shall hear it and rejoice what the passage is going to be talking about Sunday. So you may hear this one again, Psalm 34. And he concludes it, O oh, magnify, verse 3, O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So again, a call for others to join David in, in giving honor and praise and worship and exalting the Lord. The same as what we see here in, in Psalm 110. Let us, let us praise the Lord. Now, I see a... Uh, a spiritual principle here, too, that I want to share with you. And it's this, a life that is dedicated to honoring God is a life that other people will take note of. And it will, in essence, draw them to the Father. The Scripture teaches that we should, we should try to live our lives in such a way that other people will say, what is that about? And I'm not talking about your peculiarity. <laughs> that's, that's not what I mean. <laughs> what is that? I don't mean it like that. I mean it like this woman or this man lives their life in, in such a way with such conviction, such confidence, such an awareness, such an understanding. I want to know more about that. I want to know more about that. Now, some people just try to boil it all down to say, well, if you'll just be this kind of marshmallow Christian, you know, the warm, fuzzy, soft kind of believer, that that will attract people. It's like, well, actually, I don't know if that does or not. I think confidence and a strong faith that's demonstrated, because faith is an action, it's a verb, right? A faith that is demonstrated through the trials of life, I think that's what attracts people. So the spiritual principle is that a life that's dedicated to honoring God is a life that attracts people. It's dedicated to praising God. And what we're really talking about there is our testimony. You do understand that your testimony, even uh, regardless of what you happen to think about your personal testimony, well, I don't have much of a testimony. You have a testimony. You have a testimony. And it is about what God has done in your life. And believe me, if you'll start sharing that, you will be amazed, I believe, at the lives God will touch through your testimony that you don't think you have. Because, and here's the reason, because there are a lot of people in similar situations as you, and they think, what have I got? I, I don't have a testimony. Actually, they do. God does a work in everybody's heart, right? God changes everyone who comes into contact with him, who receives through faith the finished work of Christ on their behalf. That fundamentally changes people, changes their thinking from what they were. And God begins to transform them. Walking with God, honoring him with our lives leads us to desire him even more. And that's what the psalmist says 
in verse 2. Notice it says that great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. Great are the works of the Lord. They are studied by all who delight in them. I'm so thankful, brothers and sisters, that I've got eyes to see, like, like Jesus said so many times. Eyes to see and ears to hear. That the Holy Spirit has done that work in me so that I can look around. I can look at my life. And Kathy and I are in a particularly... particularly focused period of time in our lives where we're just very, very thankful. Every morning that we get up, and you already know because I've shared it dozens of times, we have our own quiet time and then we come together and have a, a devotional time together before we get ready and go to work. And it's such a sweet time to spend with each other. And we're so very blessed and thankful. So very blessed and thankful. It's important that we evaluate our lives and thank God for everything that he's done. And I'm not, I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about material things at all. I'm talking about all the work that God has done in my life, in Kathy's life, to bring us to the place that we are today. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about all that molding and shaping and pulling and forming and all of that stuff. And listen, I'm, I'm not saying he's done because he is not. He still has a work to do in me. And I'm glad. I don't want him to leave me like I am now. Please, Lord, don't do that. Please keep working. <laughs> but I'm thankful. I'm thankful for the place that the Lord has us. I'm thankful as I look at what he's doing and the, and, 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 and the things that are, that are unfolding, the steps that I see in the very near future. I'm thankful for all of that. It's important we take time to meditate upon the Lord and His goodness and everything that He's done, bringing us through these many years, providing for us through the ups and downs, the heartbreak and the sorrow and the disappointment. He has been faithful through all of that. And so the psalmist says, greater the works of the Lord, they are studied by all who delight in them. That's evaluation. That's meditation, folks. That's recounting the great works that God has done in you and, and, and through you and as a result of your prayer, his answering your prayer and working in the lives of other people. And I mean, it just goes on and on and on and on. They're studied by those who delight in them. And there's great benefit in doing that. As I thought about that statement, that truth, as I was preparing for this, this teaching tonight, it reminded me that meditating upon the goodness of God towards us teaches us a number of things. First of all, the very first thing that came to my mind was humility. Humility. Arrog arrogance has no place in the life of a believer. Pride has no place in the life of a believer. And again, it's interesting how the, this teaching and Sundays are teaching is intersecting. <laughs> Because pride has no place in the life of a believer, and we're going to see that in Mark chapter 10, Sunday. So it teaches us humility when we contemplate God's marvelous works, when we meditate upon his goodness. It teaches us humility, but it also teaches us gratitude. Gratitude. 
thankfulness. It gives us hope. Hope for today and for tomorrow. It helps us to persevere when we consider the works of God. When we recount all of those things that he's done in our life, in us and through us, things that we've witnessed. And it also gives us a long-term view of life. And we understand that, that life, this faith journey that we're on, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Yeah, it's a long run. But we're encouraged in the scripture to run the race well. Run the race well. So meditating upon those things, being thankful, pursuing him with all your heart, brings balance into your life. It gives us a long-term view. It makes those events that seem so big at the time, it kind of levels them out a little bit. Those mountains over time start becoming rolling hills instead of just the world's coming to an end. I know some Christians like that. You probably do too. Everything that comes down the pike that is, that is negative or causes them any amount of distress, it's, it's all of a sudden the, you know, the earth's about to implode into a black hole, save us. <laughs> and as we consider this, as we consider God's works in creation, in and through us, it leads us to understand just how majestic and just how powerful he really is. That's verse 3. Splendid and majestic is his work, and his righteousness endures forever. He is the everlasting one who always remains the same. I'm so thankful. When I began to to read and comprehend uh, what the Bible says about the Father. One of my very earliest epiphanies, one of my very earliest, you know, discoveries, of course, by the understanding of the Holy Spirit, is that God is immutable. God is immutable. What does that mean? That means He is unchangeable. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Aren't you glad? I am thrilled that he is unchangeable. You know why that's important? Because if he wasn't, if he wasn't immutable, if he wasn't unchangeable, it'd be his prerogative to kind of move the marker. You know, here's a requirement. Can you hurdle that? you know what? You've been pretty disobedient and rebellious for the last couple of years. I think I'm going to move the requirement up to here. Can you get over that? God's not capricious like that. So the standard is my son. Have you placed your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, his finished work on Calvary's cross for the forgiveness of your sins? And if you have then stop sinning and walk as a disciple. That's what the Lord asks. Walk as a disciple. He's not there to beat you over the head with a stick, wrap you on the knuckles every time you mess up, but he will remind you through his Holy Spirit, won't he? But how gentle and loving that is, the correction of the Holy Spirit that comes into our lives. He is the everlasting one, verse 3 always remains the same. And he's enabled us to understand who he is by what we observe in, in creation. Look at uh, verse 4. He has made his wonders to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and compassionate. We remember when our minds become alive to God. Then we can see the blinders are taken off of our eyes and when we look at things we marvel at just how all of this could be and how 
magnificent and powerful God must be to have done all of this. The creation itself. It, our conscience just bears witness to what our eyes see in the creation, what we observe. We remember when God started changing us, when we had a check in our spirit. And I've got a lot of funny stories <laughs> to tell. You know, the day after we're saved, we have a new home address. <laughs> we have a new destiny address the day after we're saved. Because the day after we're saved, we have become joint heirs and adopted sons and daughters of the Father, right? But that doesn't mean that our behavior has changed <laughs> just as quickly, right? doesn't mean our language has changed just as quickly. doesn't mean that our thought life has changed just as quickly. And I, I can remember... I got saved on a Sunday and went back to work on Monday and I didn't say a word to anybody that I worked with. But it was before, I mean, I, I didn't even make it half the day. It was before lunch, before someone said, what is wrong with you? <laughs> and I said, what are you talking about? You're different. What, what, what happened? I mean, can you tell me? And so I was able to tell them I got saved. Now, they weren't much interested at that point of hearing it because I think they wanted to see it walked out, lived out, see if it's true. Maybe they knew people that proclaimed they got saved, but it didn't stick or whatever. But I can remember incidences when... <laughs> Kathy and I would be doing something and something would happen and I'd let something slip and, and she'd look at me and I'd look at her just shocked, you know, that a word came out of my mouth. And, um, and we laughed about it. And the reason it was funny is because we knew we were changed creatures, but we also knew there was still some residual. But the Lord does a thorough job of cleaning you up. <laughs> but I remember when things started changing. When we would think, well, let's go do this. And it's like, oh, wait, we can't do that. <laughs> we can't do that anymore. That's not who we are. God's given us brains capable of thought, memory decision-making based on his revealed truth. That is very gracious and compassionate for God to do that. And so it allows us there, verse 4, to see his wonders and to recall them, to remember his goodness, his graciousness, his compassion, verse 4. He's given us brains to be able to do that. And what a wonderful gift that is. Sometimes we forget that. You think about the animal kingdom. They don't have that capacity. The animal kingdom operates purely by instinct. It's the law of the jungle. Might makes right. If I need it and I'm stronger than you, I'm taking it. Humans don't operate that way. Our minds are superior to that. And we need to train ourselves to operate by the truths of what God has revealed to us. His wonders there in verse 4. So after all of this, after encouraging people to worship the Lord, to praise God, to honor Him, to remember Him, to meditate on His wonders, starting in verse 5 and really through probably verse 8, I think it's safe to say, verses 5 through 8, the psalmist seems to be thinking specifically 
of Israel, specifically of Israel. But there are some things in there for us. But let's, let's talk about this first. Verses 5 through 8. 5 through 8. He has given food to those who fear him. He will remember his covenant forever. He has made known to his people the power of his works in giving them the heritage of the nations. The works of his hands are truth and justice. All his precepts are sure. They are upheld forever and ever. They are performed in truth and uprightness. Now, if this is talking about Israel, and and it, it seems to me that it is. It seems to me that Israel is in view here. If that's what the psalmist has in mind, then verse 5, when it says food, is very likely the manna that God provided his people by which they were fed in the wilderness. And if that's the case, then the covenant there in verse 5, it says, he will remember his covenant forever is likely the covenant established at Mount Sinai during their wilderness wanderings. In verse 6, it talks about the works, God's works. Now, that's very likely the miracles that God performed in, in Egypt, the plagues, where He actually brought them out of Egypt. And also, His wonders, His works in the wilderness. What were those? You can recount them cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, supernaturally producing water for them, manna, quail, the bronze serpent we talked about last Sunday that was lifted up in the wilderness for all who would look upon it to be saved from those fiery serpents. Supernatural protection is what is in view there in verses 5 through 8. The giving them the heritage of the nations, it says there, that's the conquest of Canaan. The conquest of Canaan. And in verses 7 and 8, we see the giving of God's law. And we see that it's on the basis of his character. The works of his hands are truth and justice. His precepts are sure. They're upheld forever and ever. They're performed in truth and uprightness. Those are characteristics of God. So the giving of the law, the foundation of the law, is based on God's character, is what's being described there for us. We can also see a lot of applications for ourselves living today as New Testament Christians. Back in verse 5, we proclaim and we say often as part of our testimony that God provides our needs day by day. In fact, Jesus taught us to pray that way. Give us now our daily bread. Give us now our daily bread. We are a most blessed people. For all of the issues that we have in America today, we are still the most blessed people in my opinion, on the face of the earth. I don't know that that will last. I don't know that it will always be that way in my lifetime. I I don't know. But I can say right now, today, that America is a most blessed nation and people. And then when it comes to the covenant being based on God's character, the Bible says in Hebrews 7, 22, note takers, 7, 22, that Jesus has become the guarantee of a better covenant. The covenants, the Old Testament covenants, the, especially the Abrahamic, the Davidic, and the Mosaic, those are all specifically aimed toward and will find their fulfillment in Israel, the nation, the people, the Jews. We have a much better covenant than all of that that's been established through the Lord Jesus and his sacrificial death on our behalf. Hebrews 9.15 says that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant and that his death paid the ransom to set us free from sin. Now that's a reason to say hallelujah. (laughs) 
That is a reason to honor him. Our own exodus from the wilderness was our deliverance from the bondage of sin. As whether or not we can describe our lives before Christ this way, it nevertheless is an accurate picture, spiritually speaking, that apart from Christ, you are in a spiritually barren, desolate desert. And when Christ came into your life and you were born again, then all of a sudden, that barrenness and that desert was replaced with a, with a lushness and an environment most beautiful to behold. What a remarkable work the Lord has done. We have overcome the world through Jesus Christ, this new covenant. Because Christ has overcome, we are overcomers. It means that we've overcome this Canaan, this world that we live in. This world is not our home. It just is not. Aren't you thankful that's true? I sure am. Even though Kathy and I have a brand new home, I'm glad that's not my eternal home. I am so thankful this is not my final destination. We are just passing through, and that's it. Hallelujah. So in the meantime, while we're passing through, I pray we would always remember these truths, especially the ones in verses 7 and 8 that outline for us God's character, that He is truth, that He is just, that His ways, His precepts are right, and that they're everlasting. You know, that helps me more and more and more. The older I get, it helps me to remember that God's ways are everlasting. All of the skeptics, all of the deniers, all of the God-haters, all of those that hurl insults and, and all kinds of blasphemous language toward Christians today, and it's only going to get worse. I am much better equipped to respond to that because I know that God's ways, our, they are perfect, they are eternal, and he will bring them to pass. And I actually pity those people. I especially pity those people who may be beyond rescue. And you know that is a distinct possibility for a lot of folks today. They continue to, to blaspheme God with their outrageous behavior and their words and their language and their thoughts. God might turn them over. He might just turn them over. And that's a sad thing to consider for anybody because that means truly they will bust hell's gates wide open. Now, all of this, this comprehension of, of all these things that we've been talking about is made possible by what we read in verse 9. Notice it says that God has sent, He has sent, redemption to his people he has ordained his covenant forever holy and awesome is his name the bible says that the world considers god's ways often even god himself as foolishness i see it all the time i hear it all the time how can you believe in god god doesn't exist what's wrong with you I hear it all the time but those who have the Holy Spirit of God, they have greater insight, greater knowledge, greater wisdom. What God ordains will come to pass. We know that. We know that that is a spiritual principle and truth of eternity. What God has ordained will come to pass. And I think about the unfortunate people who do not comprehend the importance of Israel to God. I keep coming back to that because I see a lot of things going on in the church today that really break my heart. 
especially as it concerns Israel. Again, the covenants that God has made with Israel will come to pass. Right now they are being held as a promise. The Abrahamic covenant is what? The promise of the land. At, at, at no time in the history of the world has Israel occupied the land that God has promised them. But they will. Do you know when that time is? During the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. The Abrahamic covenant will be fulfilled in the millennium. The Davidic covenant has not been fulfilled, but it will. The Davidic covenant says that God will put a king on the throne in Jerusalem of the line of David. Now, I happen to believe that naturally Jesus reigns from Jerusalem, but I think there's biblical support, and maybe I should share that with you next time we're on this subject. I happen to believe that maybe even a resurrected King David will once again, as Christ rules the world, King David might rule in Jerusalem. I'll share that with you next time. <laughs> but those two covenants cannot be fulfilled because when is the Davidic covenant fulfilled? During the millennial reign of Jesus Christ upon the earth. Well, we haven't got there yet. In both of those covenants, the Abrahamic and the Davidic, they're not going to be fulfilled until the millennium, but what else happens right before the millennium begins? Paul says it in Romans chapter 11, I believe it is. He says, God is not done with his people Israel. And then he says, all Israel will be saved. And that used to puzzle me. Because I used to think, how, how is it possible that every person in the nation of Israel is going to be saved in that day? Well, I mean, I know God can do that. But, wow, every person, all Israel? And then I wondered, is that hyperbole? And then I came to understand as I studied the scriptures and I, and I grew in, in, in understanding and maturity, what I came to understand was what precedes the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ upon the earth, the tribulation period. What is the tribulation period? What does Revelation chapters 4 through 19 teach? That before Christ comes back and defeats Satan, the Antichrist, the false prophet, casts them in, to the lake of fire, wipes out the, the armies of the kings that assemble themselves to come against the Lord. Two-thirds of the world's population is wiped out through all of the judgments. So how many Jews, those of Israel, will be present upon the earth when Christ comes and sets up the millennium? One-third. One-third. One third of the Jews that enter the tribulation period will survive it. And it says in, in Zechariah chapter 12, it talks about it in Deuteronomy chapter 17, that in order for the, for the Jews, for Israel, to actually possess, to have the covenants fulfilled, the Abrahamic and the Davidic covenant fulfilled in their lives, they have to receive and accept the king of God's choosing. Deuteronomy chapter 17. And they will do that, Zechariah the prophet says, Zechariah chapter 12, but they will look on him whom they have mourned and they will weep because they will recognize him as their Messiah. And interestingly, the reason that modern day Jews reject Jesus is because they say, well, Messiah, when he comes, he's going to bring peace to the earth. Jesus didn't bring peace. He didn't even get rid of the Romans. Well, guess who's bringing peace when he comes riding in? <laughs> the Lord Jesus. And as the Jews recognize the king of God's own choosing, as they receive him as their Messiah, then the Abrahamic covenant will be fulfilled 
in their time and in their lives and they will have the land. And the Davidic covenant will be fulfilled in their time and in their lives and a king will be on the throne from David's line. I don't understand why or how Christians can miss this. It's such an important time in our history. History of the world. God is not done with Israel. The Davidic covenant is going to be realized one day. When all this comes to pass, the whole world's going to know about the holiness of God. The psalmist concludes here, chapter 111 with verse 10, very well known. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all those who do his commandments. His praise endures forever. After all is said and done, wisdom begins when we fear or honor God. Knowledge of who God is results in the wisdom of fearing him. The wisdom of fearing him, fearing his holiness. But wisdom also results in action, doesn't it? obeying him. Therefore, wisdom is obedience to all that God reveals to us. And where might we find God's revelation to us? Well, that's the Bible. (laughs) That's the scripture. That's why reading and meditating upon the Bible is so important, brothers and sisters. That's why it's important to be in the word. That's why a consistent prayer life is so important. We want to commune with God. We want to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit as he gives direction and illuminates our thinking and our understanding that we might act wise, i.e., demonstrate obedience. Be obedient to the Lord. C.H. Spurgeon wrote, quote, The proper study of God's people is God. The highest science, the loftiest speculation The mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of the child of God is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his Father. End quote. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian believers that our warfare as believers is to destroy fortresses high and lofty speculations and every vain thing that lifts itself up and challenges the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. What we believe about God, brothers and sisters, affects who and what we are and what we do and what we think. Disregard for God will put you on a quick slide into the pits of darkness. Honor and praise for him, and you will be lifted up daily on eagle's wings, strengthened for whatever it is that you're going to face during the day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your word, for this Psalm 111 and its encouragement for us, its reminder to us of the value and the importance of honoring you, of meditating upon you and remembering and recalling all of your wonderful works. We thank you, Father, for what you have done in our lives individually. And we thank you for what you have and are doing in our lives corporately as a body of believers. Lord, we pray that you would continue to protect us from the evil one, that you would continue to lead us by your Holy Spirit into the things that you would have us to do. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for preserving it for us. We love you, Lord, and we pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.